Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the wonderful swamp pit that is Rekiel. Today, we're gonna feed this tree, and from it, we're gonna get beautiful resin. We can then turn into iso resin. And why do we care about iso resin? Because when you take iso resin down to our beautiful molecular forge, you can make two things out of it insulation and visco gel. Mmm, visco gel. The liquid that just keeps on giving. Unfortunately, this tree is really hungry and you don't get a lot of resin when you feed him. We'll go into all that and we'll show you how really bad this situation is as far as getting resin. But right now, it's the only way to get resin in the game. And the devs have thought it smart to make sure that we have to work to get our resin. And that's what we shall do. I've started to set up a little sort of colony away station sort of thing we don't need much but we are going to need an exosuit forge to repair our exosuits and that will require power as well did we just build that out of steel no let's not let's not do that now as i was saying this is going to require power we do have enough power here and that would be a good temporary usage of it right the only thing these solar panels and battery module are powering are these beautiful Atmosuit docks and the gas pump that feeds them. So this isn't a big deal. We could definitely siphon off that power. But we're also going to need another power setup when we leave this planet. The idea is I want to feed this tree without any dupe interaction. I want to set it and forget it, and I want to keep it simple stupid. That's the name of the game today. Let's find out a way to do this without any duplicate labor once we leave. So first, we need to put some power in place. Lucky for us, we brought enough glass for solar panels. I think two should be able to do it, right? Just in case, let's go ahead with the three setup. We'll do a small pyramid. That looks like it'll work well. Instead of doing a pyramid where we're losing a little bit, why don't we just build a long enough platform to just straight up do three solar panels? We don't really care too much about the real estate here. Yeah, that'll work a lot better. We're using gold amalgam because, well, this planetoid has a lot of gold amalgam. Then we'll bring the power back in by use of one of these beautiful heavy watt joint plates. And that way we can throw down a beautiful smart battery, say, here. We'll have to move a couple of storage bins. And there's a reason why we're using a smart battery instead of the standard group of jumbo batteries when using solar panel power. And the reason for this is heat. Once we leave, we want to make sure this place is on autopilot, so we never really have to come back. Hopefully for no maintenance. Unfortunately, though, things cause heat. So the smallest amount of heat that we can produce, the longer this colony can go without us. And without any sort of cooling solution. While the dupes are busy doing that, I figured it'd be a good time to fill you in on some of the stuff we've done in the background. But first, as we put a couple of pneumatic doors here, and this turned their access control off. We don't want any more dupes coming through here and getting hit by what the best name I've heard is the Whomping Willow. If you have got a better name for this tree, please let me know. Experiment 52B doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, but Whomping Willow does seem to be the front runner. You can see here Megatron has some severe wounds because he decided to get a little too close to the tree. Eh, not so good. He'll eventually heal up, but you know, it's better to keep him away from the tree for now. Additionally, we've also grabbed the two terrestrial artifacts from this planetoid. The first being the honey jar, and the second, the grub grub statue. We're gonna need a little bit more refined metal. Yes, we could just run everything with steel, but that seems to be irresponsible. So we're gonna put in a, a rock crusher, which is almost as irresponsible. But that's neither here nor there. Because remember, using the rock crusher means that we're gonna lose about 50% of whatever we put into it in order to get the refined metal that we want. In this case, gold amalgam. Now the question arises: what are we going to feed this tree? You heard in the last episode that we're probably going to go with Paku in one of another one of our infinite Paku branches. There are a couple other options, and I wanted to at least make you aware of it, because your planetoid is going to be similar. Click over on the star map, we can go over to Rekiel, and you can see that it does have a chlorine gas vent. You could then take that chlorine and feed bomb lilies. Not even really feed them, just have them grow, because the bomb lilies don't actually eat any of the chlorine, they just need to live into it. So that's one option. But in order to harvest the bomb lily, and then get it to feed to the tree, 
would require duplicate labor. But I think we can manage to get some Paku fillets without duplicate labor. So I believe we're going to start setting up a nice Paku ranch in this little area. It already has some polluted water. The distance it will need to travel is not very far. And it seems to be enough room. Let me see what I can get going. All right, we have our basic power infrastructure set and we got our rock crusher going. And I wanted to highlight the reason why we're using the smart battery. So the smart battery produces 500 DTUs of heat. You'll notice that compared to the smart battery, the jumbo battery produces 1250 DTUs of heat. That's a lot more heat. It's over double the amount of heat that the smart battery produces. Now, yeah, our rock crusher produces a lot of heat, but we're not concerned about that once we leave because the rock crusher will not be used. Neither will the exosuit forge. Remember, we need the exosuit forge while we're here to continuously repair Atmo suits. In other news over on Fertilera, looks like Alita's brought back two artifacts this time. Unfortunately, one's a duplicate. Now we have two office mugs, which I guess can, can be convenient. And then we have a tornado rock. Uh-huh. And since we're here, I figured it'd be a good time to do a critter count on our beautiful Paku farm. 149. The game's starting to bug out to where this Paku has reached adult age before it's figured out how to flop over to the little infinite Paku pond. We also have 44 eggs getting ready to go. And four gulp fry and tropical fry eggs over here we're going to be using a system similar to this over on recule but much more scaled down and much more maintenance free because remember we don't want any maintenance so we're going to make it to where we're going to have one fish live as long as it can on the algae that's there and then every paku that's sitting in the infinite paku pond will just continually be starvation farmed and produce an egg and die off producing that Paku filet. We've also been doing some digging on Rekul. We've already bored all this out and we're gonna get all of this down here. And the reason why is because we want every last bit of algae and slime. And why slime? Because we can turn that slime into more algae. And we do that with the assistance of the beautiful algae distiller. Yes. It's not often that you build an algae distiller, but this is one of those cases we want more algae doesn't take too much power to make it go only 120 watts and then we just provide a, a vent for it to get rid of all the polluted water and we're good for now i think we can just put the polluted water down here we may end up using some more in our little prefab tank we're building i love it when planetoids have been sitting for a long time you can see this one thimble reed plant even though it's wild has produced 26 reed fiber that is incredible now the wonderful magic of the algae distiller is not a one-to-one -one ratio. It uses 600 grams of slime and produces 200 grams of algae. So one to three for the algae, the rest comes out in polluted water that we really don't care about. But this will take all that slime and turn it into algae. And on top of all the algae the planetary naturally had, we're gonna be sitting probably, I'm guessing 40 tons of algae. And 40 tons of algae is enough to feed a Paku for about 285 cycles at a rate of 140 kilos of algae per cycle if we keep one Paku as a breeder. After 285 cycles of a Paku breeding and creating eggs, we're going to have a ton of eggs that will turn into Paku, which then will turn into their own eggs. In fact, if we go back over to our breeder tank on Fertilera, we can be reminded that, hey, a happy Paku lays an egg at a rate of 67% per cycle. So if we're breeding up one single Paku for 285 cycles, that'll give us about 190 eggs who will all in turn become Paku. That means we'll have 190 Paku in our infinite Paku pond over on Rekul. And I'm just fine with 190 Paku feeding the experiment 52b that seems like a decent enough rate to me in order to avoid our dupes from consistently getting the sopping wet we're just gonna move the vent over here and put a nice mesh tile here and that way the polluted water will just come down and 
sink into what's going to be the natural pond of the planetoid. And then we can mop the rest of this up and put it into our Paku tank. Now continue on with our Paku ranch. We're going to make sure that we seal it in. And that way this polluted oxygen can off gas and fill this area with an atmosphere. Otherwise, the devices that we will have in here will eventually overheat. Oh, and our little Paku fry has been born. And already starting to eat some of that delicious algae. It looks like it's time to set up our tank further. Alright, this is the beginning of our system. We're going to store the algae in these storage bins down here. And that way, this auto sweeper will be able to pick the algae up out of the storage bins and continuously reload the fish feeder. The auto sweeper will also be responsible for putting the eggs in this conveyor loader, which will then go off to our little hatch farm and Paku plank. Alright, this is the system we've come up with. It's a little bit different than our Paku plank over on Fertilera, but it functions the same. All of our gulp fry and tropical fry eggs are going to come to this tank and automatically go over into this pond. Our fry eggs are going to start here. And if there is one or more critters in this tank, this door is going to stay shut. Which means the fry egg will hatch. And the little fishy will go across and into the pond. But if this tank needs a fish, and its current count is at zero, when the fish hatches, this door will be open, and it'll flop down and fall into the tank. Now we have three conveyors here. The first one is set on the Paku fillets, so whenever a fish dies, the Paku fillet will be transported up and dropped off at the tree for the tree to eat. The second conveyor loader drops off all the gulp fry and tropical fry eggs to this conveyor chute. And then finally, this conveyor loader drops off all the standard fry eggs to this conveyor chute. We are storing all of our algae in these tanks here. Right now it's about 25 tons, but we're slowly working through the slime as well. And once all that slime's converted to algae, it will also be put into these tanks. This, can, this auto sweeper has full access to this tank to be able to scoop up all the Paku fillets and any eggs. And then this auto sweeper's purpose is to just grab the Paku fillets from the infinite Paku pool and then throw them in for the tree to eat. Now this system will take a little while to get it going because we are just running the one Paku. And we're doing that so that we can feed one Paku as a breeder for as long as possible, which will increase the amount of fish that'll ultimately end up in the infinite Paku pool. Even when this fish dies and there's no more algae to feed them, this Paku pool will continually self-generate because whenever a fish has an egg, it'll restart the whole process. The fish will be born or the fish will hatch, drop off into this little pool and eventually starve, but not before it has its own egg. Which reminds me, I need a way to get the eggs out of there right now. These conveyor loaders are not in the right positions. This auto sweeper that has access to this pool needs access to these two conveyor loaders as well. All right, that's much better. Now all the Paco fillets go in this conveyor loader, and then the eggs go into these two conveyor loaders. And both auto sweepers have access to all three conveyor loaders. Perfect. Now we have to figure out what happens after we feed the tree. I believe the point where we're supposed to drop the food is here. We've done a little bit of cleaning up to make sure that the only thing going in there is the food. But there's still a lot of automation wires and stuff that are just hanging around that were that came with the tree. I want to get rid of those. So unfortunately, someone's going to have to get hit. I know, it's, it's regrettable. Same thing for power wires. Like, what is this? This junk. Alright, so uh, let's go ahead and unlock the doors and see how the dupes fare. Alright, that wasn't too bad, but now you need to go pick up your mess. Look at the mess you made, guys. Alright, once the tree eats, resin's gonna come out of the tree and then go down into here. I think we should probably replace these all with mesh tiles. That way we don't miss any of the resin that's gonna naturally fall on these tiles as well. We can replace those from the bottom, I believe. So, well, then we'll have a pump in here that will take all the resin and send it back to our 
home colony on Fertilera. This is where it's going to get difficult, though. We have to send all that stuff back, and the only method that we have requires rad bolts. Over here in our rocketry menu, we have the interplanetary launcher. This beautiful beast here can send things all over the star map, which is great, because that's what we want. Unfortunately, their payloads require wire rad bolts so it looks like we need to start collecting rad bolts from the only way we have right now and that is light fortunately for us on the power front it is only 240 watts which means with one transformer and all of this stuff plus a liquid pump we may be able to run two rad bolt generators i don't know though because we only have the three solar panels i think step one is going to be increasing the amount of solar panels and then maybe adding a few more of the smart batteries so that way we don't lose any rad bolts during the night time when the solar panels run out of juice. All right, we'll start off with four more additional smart batteries. And remember, the reason why we're using smart batteries, they just generate less heat. So I discovered a small flaw with our system. Polluted water, when it emits polluted oxygen, it actually takes some of the polluted water with it. You can see the Paku in this tank are overcrowded because they don't have eight tiles of water each because the polluted water is emitted so much. I guess it's time to start adding some regular water, shall we? Now with this tank, I'm not as worried about it. Mostly because the atmosphere here is gonna be saturated so this polluted water will eventually just not go off. But also because this one fish has many more tiles than just eight. So it would be good for a long time anyways. But eventually, nobody will be breathing this oxygen, so it'll be okay. Just in case, though, we've put the thin layer of standard water on top of the polluted water. That will also help it not off-gas. You may notice that we have another conveyor loader here. And that's because we're loading up all the eggshells and the polluted dirt that these Paku produce. And we're going to launch it back to Fertilera as well. All we're waiting for right now is for one of our Paku to naturally die of old age, and boom, Experiment 52B is going to get to eat. As I live and breathe, I will continuously have to go back and fix the problems that I made. I was looking at these Paku fry like, hey, why are you confined, buddies? Like, you're supposed to be happy. Oh, that's right, you need at least eight tiles in your room. Time for a little, little revamp here. Okay, the renovations are complete. Now the Infinite Paku Pond has plenty of space that will not be confined. So they'll keep breeding and keep laying eggs themselves, which is why it becomes an Infinite Paku Farm. We moved the auto super around to be able to facilitate the new positioning. And it looks like we have our first Paku fillets actually being loaded up in the conveyor loader now. Oh yes. Now we get to see what happens when you feed the tree. Breakfast time, Angry Tree. Aw, it's using its little hands. So right now, after two Paku fillets, it has 5.8 kilos of resin. You probably need to feed it a bit more before it'll actually spit some of that resin out. And there's Wheeljack once again taking a narcoleptic nap. A cycle or two ago, the Paku that was in here passed. It became Paku Filet and was fed to the tree. We also increased the number of Paku into the tank to two. And now you can see our newest Paku Fry is about to drop into the tank. I decided on two because it's going to take so long for this infinite Paku pool to spool up. Might as well do two for now. If we need to later, we can reduce it down to one. But for right now, two will be just fine. So I don't know when the tree actually drops the resin that it has, but that's okay. It's now going to be sort of on autopilot. We're going to keep the dupes here for a little bit while longer so they can fill the algae distiller. But I wanted to show you a couple other features. When the tree finally does drop the resin, we're going to pump the resin through these pipes. We put a little bit of water here and that'll help keep the rad bolt generator and the interplanetary launcher cool. You can see we have the radiant liquid pipes here, so it'll at least stay in a temperature where they will not break. We added a little bit more power generation and some batteries, and now the batteries have enough juice to last the evening until the solar panels turn back on. 
Eventually, it'll even be better because this algae distiller will not be taking up its power. We have about 17 tons left of slime to refine. But after that, we'll be taking all of these things out. Packing up everything that's in these storage bins onto our ships. And then sending them away. We also set a little memorial for our buddy Rover. You can see we put a couple abstract sculpture. And the reason why they're abstract is because, well... We just gave Megatron enough art fundamentals to be able to work on any sculpture. And fittingly, though, they came out to be the hearts. Very fitting for our lovely buddy, Rover. In the background, we've been sweeping everything up. We put everything in these storage bins, and when we're ready to go, we're going to transfer everything from the storage bins inside the rockets, and then we'll cart it on home with us. With our interplanetary launcher getting loaded with polluted dirt, eggshells, and eventually resin, I think it's a good point to show how it actually works. First, you have an availability to change its destination. Where do you want its shells to be launched? You also can set the minimum mass, saying, hey, if it's 10 kilos or above, you are good to launch. You can set it all the way up to 200 to conserve rad bolts. We've already received one shell here, and it contains some polluted dirt. But the way it works is this targeting beacon tells the interplanetary launcher where to shoot. The shells will come down here, and then get loaded into this payload opener. The payload opener doesn't take any power per se, but it takes dupe labor and what is another adorable animation. They open the can and dump it in this little pot here. Since we have liquids and we have solids coming through this payload opener, we need to highlight what we're doing with each. For the solids, they're just getting dumped into a conveyor chute right here. Easy peasy. For the liquids, whenever we do get that resin, it's going to come down through here. And then all the way down to our steam room. Once it makes it to our steam room, that resin will turn into iso resin. I wanted to show you another small bug. You can see our two artifact transport modules have office mugs in them. Apparently... Once we've collected an artifact, it just collects it again and again and again. I even sent it to a second location, but because it wasn't doing any drilling here, it just says available. It wasn't doing any drilling because it ran out of diamond. But it looks like the artifact collection at the asteroids is still a little bit buggy. Our rad bolt generator is about to fire another rad bolt into the interplanetary launcher. And it will take its payloads, here we go, and launch them over to Fertillera. If you go to the star map, you can actually see the payloads. And they move pretty quick. It's only going to take it a half a cycle to travel five tiles. We'll go over to Fertillera and wait for it to arrive. The launched round is about to land on Fertillera. And there it ended up. From what I understand, it comes close to the targeting beacon, but doesn't always hit where it's supposed to. It ends up with ready to unpack status. A duplicate will come over, grab it, and put it into the payload opener. And you can see its contents are 200 kilos of polluted dirt. Looks like Magnus has the honor. And just like a can of tuna fish, we're going to open it up and then dump it inside. Way to go, buddy. With that, our automated system is complete. Now it's just a matter of time before our infinite Paku pawn spins up and starts providing a more regular source of Paku fillets for our tree. Next time, we'll get to finally see the tree drop some resin. Right now, I have the liquid pump kind of cut off because I want to make sure that I find out how much resin it needs before it'll finally drop it through these little pipes. I'm looking forward to that, and I hope you had as much fun watching the episode as I did making it. Talk to you soon.